Welcome to the monthly Building Forensics Mastermind webinar. Um, this is always 30 minutes where we just go deep into a couple jobs that I did in the last month. So it's basically a reality show for home performance. This month, because it's spring, and right now, as I speak to you in Chicago, it is like 70 degrees outside. So as soon as I'm done with you guys here, I'm going to go out and go hit the beach or something. Um, so it's springtime, and that means that there is a very delicate thing that's happening with temperatures. And if you use infrared then you know exactly what I'm talking about because right now the temperature outside and the temperature inside is starting to be a little different and the sun is having an effect on the roof which is having an effect on the attic and that makes that temperature differential a little different. So all this stuff is very delicate. I also had a couple jobs this last month that I had to be very delicate in my explanation of how things are working. So in the uh, spirit of having to explain things and that is a huge part of our job as building forensics masterminds. Uh, let's make sure that we, first of all, know all of the things that we need to know. I give away tons of information for free on my radio show, which is the Building Performance Podcast, and on my video channel, which is uh, youtube.com slash c slash home performance. Uh, we, there's also a ton of reading that can be done in Home Performance Diagnostics, and if you don't have a copy of that book and you don't have $99 to buy it, you can preview the entire thing on the website, and I'll uh, you can get to that all through my website, which I'm going to flash up at the end. Uh, also, obviously, the certification stuff. I do video consulting for people, whether that's professionals or homeowners around the country. And also, of course, at the very uh, last piece of the list there is mastery. And I'm going to talk about that at the end. That's the full fast track. So there's a new series and I'm going through my kit one piece at a time. Uh, it's called Corbett's Toolkit. So if you want to learn more about how the kind of how I use the tools that I use specifically and how I test them to know what their tolerances are and what, you know, what's going on wrong with them, that's where you can find all that stuff on my video channel. So March. Featured jobs. Number one, we're going to talk about an older home, a uh, brick home that has comfort problems. And this home has already been through a weatherization process. This is not a low income weatherization. This is an energy efficiency rebate program that's already been air sealed and insulated. And they still have problems. And if you are not serving those clients, I recommend that you look into starting to serve those clients because that is what building forensics is all about. It's finding out the source of problems and solving them for people. And that is not done by the energy efficiency programs, just to be perfectly clear. Their job is to lower the energy waste, not to solve problems. Number two, renovated older home uh, prioritization. So like, hey, how do I begin to improve my home? Number three is a redesigned, meaning architected, right? An architect lived in this home and started messing around with the things that architects do. They have comfort problems. And number four is just a new uh, construction inspection and duct tests. It's a little candy at the very end. So let's get into the first one. This is the, the house. This was obviously on a 47.8 degree day or thereabouts. This is uh, that's not exactly how infrared works, but it's about a 50 degree day. Um, nice and cold. So floor one for the last winter and every winter since they moved in has been freezing. But floor two is too hot, right? They have a boiler system. They went through the energy efficiency rebate to get air sealing and insulation because they heard that that would make them more comfortable. They already did that. Um, so that's bad news. So all they want now is, okay, we don't know what's going on. Please just help us figure out what's going on. So here is the way the house is built. We've got two stories over a basement, which is half sunk into the ground. Uh, and there's an attic on the top, which I'm not showing in this little 3D model. This is Google SketchUp, by the way, which is what I use for all this stuff for explaining things to my clients. So it's double brick, which means it's got a, a small amount of insulation uh, space in the walls. It has the attic over top. It's got the basement that's uninsulated. It's got a boiler system. And they have lived here for 30 years. That is a very interesting kind of client because they have a huge amount of experience in the home. Now, as far as this basement goes, in the middle of the basement, there is this conditioned room that's that gray box there. I've kind of deleted the basement from this so we can see just how the first floor is being affected by the basement. All of the perimeter rooms around the basement are uh, cold storage. So the, the only room that's really conditioned, that's as warm as the rest of the house, is that center room right there. So that's something that we're going to get back to in a minute. The weatherization that was performed on this home for these homeowners, who are very sweet people, I really liked them, uh, was to insulate the walls, which they did. And this is a picture of, yeah, a wall that has stuff in it, for sure, because if the framing is not standing out clearly and the difference between the cavities and the framing isn't stark, then we know that there's something going on in the walls that's not just air. The attic has blown insulation, that's fiberglass. 
Uh, now, that's a little messier than I generally like to see it. That might be part of the scope of an energy efficiency program work because the rates and the rebates inform all this stuff. So you're not charging private market rates, whatever the market will bear. You're charging rates that are based on what the uh, utility companies have set as the rebate. Basement, not insulated. Why not? Because the energy efficiency program may not incentivize basement insulation. Secondly, there are issues with moisture in basements because, of course, we've got groundwater to maybe contend with, and we've also got condensation. So when you start doing that stuff as an energy efficiency program, it just kind of makes it more complicated. So generally, they're not big on that. But this can become a big deal, which it will in this case. Now, here's what we forgot about after we did the energy efficiency air sealing and, and insulation. Wah, wah. First of all, there is a space pack system or a, a, um, in a house that's got a boiler. They want to have air conditioning. What they have to do is just go up into the attic and run this octopus of flex ducts that are these little high velocity air conditioning ducts all over the house to so these little round ports everywhere. So now we've got this system up there. Maybe that happened after the energy efficiency work was done. But anyway, obviously, that's going to be an issue because it always is. Also, no window should ever look like this, especially in a house that's already been air sealed and insulated. Now, one of the reasons that they might not have air sealed this is because they weren't using the right tools to assess the air leakage in the house. Or maybe they did what a lot of energy efficiency program work does, which is you hit the target that you have set and then you stop because you're only going to get a certain amount of rebate out of this. So once you hit the target reduction of 20% or 30% or whatever it is, however many CFM on the blower door, then you can say, oh, we're done here. We get, we did exactly what we promised to, and now we can leave. And this is one of the side effects of that. And lastly, that is a picture of a whole house fan. Now, if you have one of these in your house, excuse me, then you'll know because it's a giant um, louvered vent thing on the top floor. These are a major problem if they are not air sealed and insulated, which 99% of them are not. And this one, <laughs> somehow they said, oh, I don't know, that's a thing, we won't worry about it. Okay, that's a big problem. So when you insulate walls, you need to have an infrared camera, period. If there's anybody on this call who is or is watching this on the YouTube channel afterwards and you are an insulator and you are not checking on your own work, then I guarantee you somebody like me is going to come along later and show your client that you did a terrible job, possibly. And you have to assume that maybe you did a terrible job. So what you're seeing here is an injection foam process. And this is a national chain that has this thing that they do. They drill in from the outside through the brick and inject foam into the cavity space behind the brick, between the brick and the plaster, so that you don't make holes in the plaster because that plaster is difficult to uh, repair. But as you can see here, they did an absolutely atrocious job. They charged them for something that they clearly did not do. This is the one of the worst insulation jobs I've ever seen. Very high-tech product, very high-tech technique that they're using, and national presence, right? All good things, but clearly didn't know what they were doing because they did not use testing to prove that they did a good job. So now my job is to prove that they did the opposite, which I definitely did. And they are absolutely going to be showing this to all of their neighbors. And that company will never get hired on the street by any of their family members either again. So here's what the testing shows once we get into past all the inspection stuff. The blower door target max that I always shoot for is my state code, which is we're on the 2012 IECC with amendments which means that we're at five air changes per hour at 50 pascals. That's the leakiest that any building that's built from scratch is allowed to be. That number for this particular house is 2598. When I run the blower door, it comes out to 3815, which is 47% over what I'm shooting for. So clearly, this energy efficiency work that was done on the air sealing and insulation, I'm not sure what they were doing exactly, but they're, they're way above what anything code-wise could be. Uh, secondly, because this is not a new home, obviously we're not going to judge it on new home code minimums, but if they were actually paying attention to things like, for example, the whole house fan, then they would have known that they could have gotten way more out of this. Uh, I, for some reason, they didn't get that whole house fan. So attic, 63% outside, uh, should be 100%, right? The reasons that it's 63% are because of all of the penetrations between the house and the attic. Now, uh, as someone who is technically uh, very state, you know, studious would tell me, this is not the uh, end of the line on this interpretation. This percentage-based thing 
isn't exactly technically accurate. There are more things going into it, and that is exactly right. But if you're going to try and explain this to your client and show that you do a good job and set expectations of how much we're going to achieve air sailing in certain zones, this is the way to do that because you don't want to tell somebody, oh, we did a blow order test at 50 pascals and then I tested your attic with relationship to the house and the attic was at 36. And because we know that there's, uh, you know, 16 square feet of ventilation between the attic and outside and I use a one-to-one -one ratio, blah, 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 blah. Don't say that stuff. So basement cold storage, 4%. That number is incredibly important because what that says is that the basement cold storage rooms on the perimeter of that basement are way more inside than outside. They are absolutely part of the house because the enclosure is made out of two things, air sealing and insulation. And the one that always, always wins is the air sealing. So the air sealing in this case says that those basement cold storage rooms are totally inside, therefore they are. So we can't pretend that they're not. The uh, second floor interior wall cavities, 10% connection to outside. Now, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a, uh, you know, two square foot hole or whatever in the top plate, but that shows that there is definitely some leakage going on. The uh, air conditioner ducts average 4%. That's a big number. And when you do pressure panning, which you'll see in my uh, video, which I'm going to show you in a, in a second here, that 4% is a big, big number. So that means that there's definitely opportunity for improvement in the duct system. And the uh, one on the duct uh, side in the master bathroom was 12% outside. That's a major connection outside. So I'm going to show you this stuff. Here's what we need to fix. First of all, whole house fan needs to be capped with an insulated airtight cap in the attic. Bam. Easy to do. In fact, you could do it in an hour or two if you had the right uh, materials. And that's rigid foam, by the way. Attic hatch. Some reason got missed. Also needs to be backed with insulation. Also needs to be weather stripped. Bam. This is that duct that's in the master bathroom. And I only know that this one has a particular problem because I tested all of them, right? So you walk around with your pressure pan and you find all this stuff. Now here's how we also fix floor one. Aside from the fact that we're gonna be air sealing the attic floor, you also have to deal with the fact that uh, there are only two things that you can do to a house. You can improve the enclosure, meaning you could do air sealing or insulation and you can slow down heat bleed into and out of the enclosure, or you can fix the engine, which means we're adding more conditioning with uh, heaters and coolers and all that stuff, right? There's only two things. So you can add more heat or you can stop heat from leaving in their case. Now, here's what I'm gonna tell them. They need to heat the basement perimeter rooms. Uh, the easiest way to do this is to strip off this possibly asbestos insulation that's wrapping these boiler pipes in the basement in the perimeter rooms. As it runs through those perimeter rooms, it's insulated. They're going to need to call an asbestos abasement company to make sure that if it is asbestos, it gets taken off in the right manner. Um, but we need to heat up those basement rooms because they're absolutely inside. And what's happening right now is that these uninsulated walls are bleeding a lot of the heat out through the foundation wall and through the slab. And that means that these uh, perimeter rooms, since they're closed off from that central basement room, need heat because heat flows from hot to cold. And one of the places they can get heat at that point is the floor upstairs. So they're sucking the heat down from floor one out through the foundation wall and the slabs. We can't insulate the slab without uh, demoing it and rebuilding a slab. We're not going to do that. And because of this mold that you're seeing and the peeling paint, I'm not sure that there's not groundwater coming in from outside. So the other solution, aside from insulating the basement walls, is to provide heat. And we're going to either do that with the boiler pipes, or we're even going to plug in a space heater and heat up those rooms with electric resistance. Yeah, I said it. Now, that's not anything that you'd ever hear somebody in an energy efficiency program say because it's against their goals. My client's goals is to fix their problems. Second house that we're going to talk about, renovated from 1888. It had stucco put on in the 30s, got stripped off in 2004. They did a whole interior renovation uh, in 2003 and 4. It is insulated in the walls and in the attic. Uh, they have a finished top floor, which you can see here on the left with that little tiny weird dormer that's sticking out that actually is at a, a kind of an angle. I've never seen that before. It was pretty neat. Uh, they have definite drafts in the house, and they've been told by their gas company that they have way more energy waste than uh, other people on their block. So they want to know, where are we supposed to start? Because we just had this place renovated. We thought that everything was done right. Please help. Do we need to replace all the windows? Do we need to add solar panels? What do we need to do? So here's their house. Now, if you know about how the enclosure works, then clearly the most important two places in the entire house are the top 
and the bottom because of stack effect. And that's addressed in another video. You should watch my other videos if you haven't already. Top of the house, very complicated. Corners are your enemy. So this is a stick frame home. It's 7,000 square feet. And as you can see, it's very complicated in shape. Now, the corner problem is that wherever you have corners, it's difficult to have perfect air sealing and perfect insulation. And all of the corners are in the very top of this house. And as you can see on the middle image here, we've got uh, bump ins. And on the uh, right hand, you can see that there's floor that's also exposed, little cantilevered floor areas or bump outs. So we've got three porches, which means that we also have three porch roofs and porch roof connections are something that we're always checking out, right? They've lived here for 20 years. Also very valuable information on how they, you know, how the winters go. They don't just have a little bit of experience in this house. They know exactly where all the drafts are, where the pipes freeze and stuff like that. So we have side attics, clearly, because as you can see in this middle image there, there's no way that that could work. So we've got side attics and there are more side attics than we actually have access to. I have access to three of them. So I look at all of them and this is what I find. There is insulation in the roof deck, and as you can see, that nice craft facing uh, that says R13, which by the way is supposed to be on the warm side, which I guess it is in this case, but the other ones don't have that, etc., etc. So maybe the attic is inside, based on what the roof insulation says on the right there, but it's also insulated away from the house at the walls. And that says maybe it's outside. So now we don't know. The thing that's going to tell you whether this side attic is inside or outside is Zonal pressure testing, that is correct. Okay, so when you start running uh, an inspection and you're looking for how the house is acting, you wanna look for very specific things. Now I happen to be in the side attic and I find this. I pull away some of this insulation that's loosely up there and there is plumbing. I can see the backside of all the plumbing on the top floor bathroom. Why hasn't this uh, pipe frozen at some point in the last 20 years? That is a great question. Or in the last 10 years, if it was just since the rehab. Great question, I don't know. But the fact is, it absolutely could freeze at any moment because this is clearly in a very confused space. This side attic doesn't know what it is. Outside, inside, eh. So there's that. There's also in the basement, we've got that on the basement wall. Now, if you haven't seen that, that's called efflorescence. It is mineral buildup from water evaporating from a surface. So it's this little flaky minerals, basically. It's, it's not a sign of anything except that water has been evaporating from this surface. That could be from outside. It could be from condensation from inside, but it's kind of a lot. So we have to kind of assume mm, there's some kind of a moisture issue going on here with the basement wall. Uh, the fact that the basement wall is not insulated is good. Now, we have a couple of vulnerabilities here. We've got some two-dimensional vulnerabilities, which are the porch roof. You can see on the far left of the left image, there's a porch roof that's tiny. There is the porch roof front and center on the front door. There's also a porch roof around the side there on the far right of the right image. And you see those three things, I'm concerned about the place where, that the plane where the roof cavity intersects with the wall of the house. That's two dimensional, right? So it's just width and height. Now here we also have 3D vulnerabilities. I have this recessed area, this porch roof is going to the side, it's going in, it's going to the side, it's coming out. So it's going to all kinds of different places. Now here's the, the difference. The floor joists in this house are running either one direction or another direction. They're running length of the house or the uh, width of the house or the length of the house, basically. In this case, when we've got this 3D vulnerability here where it goes in uh, and bumps out, that means that no matter which way the floor joists are running, we have a vulnerability into the house. There's a, pl a path where air could go into the house. Um, and the fact that we've got porches on all three sides of the house is a, is a thing. Obviously, we're gonna do the blower test. Obviously, we're looking for a certain number. In this case, it's 5265. Obviously, it's gonna be more than that because of what we already know about the house. Crazy shape, uh, the side attics are confused, right? So we are over, but we're not over by that much. Now, that being said, bigger houses that are more stories have an advantage on the air changes per hour metric, which is funny because the people who write the codes don't actually understand how blow order testing works. And that doesn't stop them from writing a code about it. Um, what would be more sensical is to use a metric of blow order test result uh, in relationship to the enclosure area, right? The actual square footage of the enclosure. That would be smarter. 
So we're only 21% over. That's not a lot. That's not twice over or 40% over or whatever they had before. Um, so there is some opportunity for improvement, but hmm, maybe, you know, it's, it's better than it seems. So the top attic is mostly outside. Side attics are mostly inside. So that's an interesting thing to know. Now we have to make a decision on those side attics. It would be easier for us, based on just the very simple metric of what we've done right here, to bring the side attics inside since they're already mostly inside. If they were mostly outside like the top attic, it's easier to just push it outside. The basement is totally inside, obviously. Every basement is this way. I'm telling you right now, if you start telling people that the basement is unconditioned, it's not true. All basements are absolutely connected to the house, and the zonal pressure test will tell you that. The floor three office, which is the room that is over that little bump in the three-dimensional vulnerability that I told you about, is uh, a major source of air leakage. We've got the side porch roof, which is 64% outside, and the front porch roof is 96% outside. Now, that tells us that only the side porch roof is the one that needs to be broken into. The ones at the front and the back are not a problem at all. Here is how you do that, by the way. You have your pressure pan, which can be a cardboard box, which I show you how to make in my new video, which I'm going to show you in a second. Um, you hook it up to your manometer, and then you cover an opening in that a cavity. In this case, we're looking at an electrical outlet. So you would cover it up, press the seal tight, and you'd read what the pressure inside the box, which means inside that cavity that you're measuring, with relationship to the house. So when you've done that, then uh, you know how to do this. Now, in this case of the porch roof, I found the porch roof vents the ventilation for those porch roofs, and I just covered it up with that. That is uh, messes with the number a little bit because there are actually multiple vents in this thing. So when I say that the porch roof is 60% connected to outside, it's probably actually a little bit more than that if I was to actually cover up all of the vents. Interesting. So this is that new video that you can watch if you want to hear more about how this stuff works. It is a simplification. It is a 15-minute crash course in zonal pressure testing. If you want to get the whole deal, read my book. Okay, so infrared. The day that I did this test, it was very warm outside. It was exactly like today. So it was 70 degrees outside, 70 degrees inside. Okay, now here is the thing. You don't have to avoid testing on those days. This picture shows that there is a maximum temperature of 76 degrees and a minimum temperature of 69.5. That's less than a 6 degree spread. Let's call it a 5 degree spread. And that is the picture that I can get with this equipment. The equipment that we have today is vastly superior to what they had in the 80s when people told you that you could only do an energy audit on a really cold day. That's total BS. Nowadays, if your equipment is good and your training is good, you can do it any old day. Here's another picture, less than a six degree spread. Here's a picture with a three or four degree spread, and you can see clearly that there are major anomalies in the enclosure. Now, this last picture here, you can see is like a three degree spread, and I can still see clearly that I can differentiate between the cavities and the framing. And when you can do that, and when you know for a fact, because you've already inspected, that this assembly that you're looking at should not be... There, there should be no delta T here, no difference in temperature. This ceiling is totally inside the house. This is between the, third, the second floor and the finished third floor. There's no reason for me to be able to see the difference between the framing and the cavities here. That tells me that there's air leakage, especially because I already looked at it before I ran the blower test, and it did not look like that. Now, during the blower test, it looks like this. Bam, I've just pinpointed that stuff. So uh, always easy to do springtime infrared stuff if you know what you're looking for and you have the right uh, equipment. Now... Remember that the renovation happened, and my job is to now tell them that, well, the renovation, you, you know, you could have done these things during the renovation. It's going to be a little bit more difficult now that we're moving into this. Air seal and insulating, obviously an opportunity at the top because we have major access in those side attics. Uh, I am going to advise them to... Uh, bring, to send the side attics outside because they don't want to use them for anything else. But they could also bring them inside, and that would be through air sealing and insulating at the roof deck. That can be a little bit more difficult in here depending on the spray foam mix and the spray foam installer and all that stuff. So around the basement, I'm going to recommend, because they have the budget for it and because they're planning on staying here indefinitely, uh, excavating the outside to make sure that there is drainage. We're going to install a drain tile, we're going to make sure that it's waterproofed, and then insulating the foundation wall. Because insulating the inside would be possibly disastrous since there might be water coming in from outside. This boiler is humongous. It is 326 kilobtu input, 260 out. It does not need to be downsized, is my opinion to them. Now they've had, uh, you know, 
HVAC professionals into the house and they say, well, yeah, if you're going to lower the load on the house by air sealing and insulating, we're going to need to replace that boiler because it won't be the right size. In my opinion, unlike air conditioning, where you're changing the dynamic of humidity to, to temperature, there's no real downside to having a humongous boiler that you don't really need. It's going to heat up, it's going to distribute its hot water, and then it'll shut off. And that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, so if it short cycles, it's already 30 years old. They don't need to replace it right away because also they're going to need to replace the radiators. Now, let's go ahead and get into number three. Number three, architect live here. These people moved in. 1990 was when it was built and it was rehabbed uh, ever since then, basically. It looks like this. You see this gigantic atrium over here on the left. Lots of recessed lights. We got two floors over a slab. It is insulated, right? And it's stick frame. We have absolute freezing temperatures in the sunken living room, which is where I'm standing when I take this picture. They lived here for one year and they know for a fact that there's major problems. The roof was just replaced. When, as soon as they moved in, they replaced the roof. So, mm, oops, I always like to, to ask just to make sure that if there is an opportunity for improvement, bam, I know you have to replace the roof anyway. Let's go ahead and think about doing insulation underneath it. The contractors uh, gave myopic advice. And when I say myopic, I mean single Singleness of purpose, right? They come in with blinders on. And they if they're an HVAC contractor, they just look at the HVAC. If they're an insulation contractor, they just look at the insulation. So, of course, they called in an insulation guy, recommended that. Window guy, recommended windows. They want to know, mm, there's must something more going on here. Please tell me what's going on. So, where are we supposed to start with all of this? So, here's what the architect did. This atrium looks like this under infrared. By the way, um, this is during a blow order test, but it didn't look much different before the blow order test. This clearly means that these cavities are not well defined because the enclosure is supposed to be contiguous and continuous, right? There's supposed to be insulation and air sealing together in a sandwich in most places. Uh, you can see that in perfectly interior cavities, there's outside air coming in. There's outside air coming into interior recessed lights. And we've got all these pretty little details with these curved windows and all this skylights and stuff. And it's just kind of a mess. So the enclosure clearly has some, some significant problems. We also have some secret cavities. There are some attic, cav uh, some attic spaces that they didn't actually know about because they haven't studied the geometry of their house in the way that we would. So I find out that, oh, there's this little attic, and so I, that's good to know, and I'll measure the, the zonal pressure in there with the pressure pan later. There's also this top plate leakage coming from that attic space, which is the same as the one on the left, down into this interior wall, which then distributes on the right here down to the floor cavity below it and distributes that cold air throughout the building. So interesting. There's all these interconnectedness uh, issues, and that's what you need to explain to your homeowners. Make sure they understand it's not doors and windows. So here's the advice. Either we can, as always, stop heat bleed, or we're going to add more heat. In this case, it is too late for the enclosure. I'm sorry, I love the enclosure, and generally that's always the best thing to do because it doesn't cost a lot of money, it doesn't cost money to run, uh, it works for a much longer without having to be maintained or replaced, but we need to add more heat. That is the problem. Um, now, again, not ever going to be recommended by an energy efficiency program. That's why they're not going to solve this person's problem, because really breaking into the enclosure and getting at all of these pretty things that this architect did to this poor house is going to run the budget into the ground. So if they were to instead spend their money on electric baseboard heat, a thousand bucks goes a long way, right? That is going to be a much better solution for them in practical terms. It is not energy efficient, it is not environmentally friendly, but it will solve their problem and it is better and easier than trying to rip back off the brand new roof that they just put on and insulating at the top because that's clearly where the enclosure needs to be. So number four is my roughed in brand new building. Now this picture should say it all, but I'm going to say it anyway. Just because it's new, does not mean that it's better, right, than an old home. And a lot of people mistake this. This is a brand new home built in a state where there is 2012 IECC is being enforced, right? And that that is a bunch of stuff going on. <laughs> there is a definite possibility for things to go wrong once we make things more complicated. So the complication is part of what's going to lead us into side effects because we're using these new products, these new techniques, um, we clearly got tons and tons of sealed combustion equipment, which is great, but also we've got all these new penetrations going all over the place. So, uh, and also pressurizations. Now, this is um, a picture of bat insulation. Is this bat insulation installed to grade one standards? And in case you're not familiar, when you do a new construction uh, inspection, grade one means it's perfect with no gaps, no compressions, no squeezing, 
nothing like that. Clearly, this is not a grade one installation. This person was in a hurry, which is very typical. And if you're a homeowner watching this and you think, oh no, that's terrible, this is happening all the time. And it's because people are rushed. They're under budget and they're over, uh, excuse me, they're over budget and they're hurried. They're right, they're past their deadline. So we're all rushing around all the time. Now this is spray foam. This is what most people think is inherently better than a bat. And if I ask you if this is a grade one installation of spray foam or of any installation, I highly doubt that any of you would tell me that, yeah, this is a really good installation. You can see there's all kinds of things going on. It's not the same depth. There's little holes. It comes through, you know, so just because you're using a new product doesn't mean that it's better. In fact, I would say the opposite. In my experience, when you are using a new product that has these, it's marketed as like, oh, this is going to solve your problems. People actually get sloppier in general than if they're using a product that does not have those things. So secondly, this is a duct test that I did the other day. I pop my head up into this attic uh, mechanical room and I count one, two, three, four, five ducts that I'm gonna have to hook up my duct tester to in order to get this reading because the cabinet is missing. And instead of just having a return plenum and a supply plenum, I have five individual ducts that are all gonna plug into these plenums that are not present today. So the first thing that I do is tell my client, this is gonna cost more money. And I tell them that I need an extra you know, 100 bucks or 200 bucks or whatever it is. Um, second thing that I have to do is figure out how I'm going to connect this because that is a six inch duct and my duct testing fan is bigger than that. So this is where duct tape does come in handy. Uh, all of this stuff, super, um, you know, simple to do once you have figured it out, but you will have to figure this stuff out on site in front of your clients and just know that. So I actually really appreciate that part of my job. Now, when you do five duct tests for a second floor that's almost 3000 square feet, what you are allowed is three CFM per hundred square feet to the 2012 IECC, which we did not amend in Illinois. This was one of the things, the HVAC guys were not in the room when we made this decision. So they have to be super, super tight. That means that because we've got 29.34 hundred square feet times three CFM, what we have max is 88 CFM is what I'm allowed to have. And I'm gonna add each of these five things up. So what I do is nine, 35, 16, 19, and 11 is what they all add up to. And I've got the HVAC contractor there sweating. All of this stuff is already insulated. It's all wrapped in insulation. It has been sealed clearly because it all adds up to 90 CFM for five tests. And just to be clear, every single time I set up a test, there's a little bit of, eh, I don't know, my test is probably leaking a little bit. Now, I don't have to guess about that. In the first place, we are over our limit. So we fail this test technically. But as you can see in this video that I'm pointing to right here, I am allowed to, because I have decided to, because I am the expert on testing in my local area, and so are you, to subtract 5 CFM of leakage from just the total. I don't do it on each individual one, although I could if I really wanted to. I don't want to because that would be kind of questionable. I happen to know for a fact that my snorkel has holes in it that leak 5 CFM, and I know that because I tested it. And I highly recommend that you do the same because if you end up in this situation, you can either make somebody's life a living hell, not just the HVAC contractor, but also the builder who's got the drywaller waiting in the next room so he can start drywalling stuff. And the code official, really 2 CFM, is not going to kill anybody. So what I do in this one case, because I know for a fact they did a good job, is subtract the 5 CFM for my test equipment. Now, if you want to become a black belt in all of this stuff, every Labor Day, I start my fall fast track. This is a six week long distance course. And last year we had people from Florida and New York and Canada and California and Nebraska, all over the place. You all get to know each other. You're all going through the uh, material at the same time. And I basically give all of my best stuff away. So this is where you can really start to get your hands around what is going on and how to test stuff in your local market so you can prove that you are much better than your competition. So. Thank you very much for uh, coming. Again, you can see all this stuff at buildingperformanceworkshop.com. I'm going to go ahead and take some questions now for the next little while.